Welcome to Disciples Net Church. We are so glad you've joined us for worship. Feel free to join in with hymns, pray with us, and share in communion. Wherever and whenever you are joining us, God's Spirit and people from all over the world are here with you. So let's prepare our hearts for worship. As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship thee. You alone are my strength, my shield, to you. Join me in allowing the Spirit to guide our hearts and shape our prayers as we approach God. Holy and loving God, we come to you today to share our hopes, our fears, our longings, and our joys. We pray that you enter our hearts to guide us as we face the reality before us. Let your Spirit speak for us today when we cannot find the words to tell you what is troubling us. We dream today of a future where all of your children live together in peace and none are wanting for any necessity. We cannot see such a world today, but we wait, sometimes patiently and sometimes impatiently, for the coming of your kingdom. As we wait, strengthen us to be part of the work in making that vision a reality. Many of us are suffering in various ways, health, poverty, lack of food or water, grief. In our sorrow, keep us mindful to share our pain with the Spirit, whom you sent us to help us bear the difficulties of our earthly life until we enter into your heavenly kingdom. Let us pause now to share in our hearts, if not in our words, the woes that we bear. Lord, hear our prayers. We also give thanks for the joys you have given us. Help us pause each day to discover those things that remind us of your love, the beauty of the natural world, the love of family and friends, the simplicity of sharing the best moments of our lives with others, the blessing of quiet and solitude when we need to listen to your voice. Let us offer thanks to the Creator God who formed us and guides us with love. Lord, hear our prayers. Our world is so far from the beautiful garden into which you placed the living beings that you created. We face wars, dissension, greed, many threats to our environment a failure to appreciate the diversity of our sisters and brothers, leaders who seek power rather than a desire to shepherd your children, and so many disruptions that are beyond our understanding. In our confusion and fear, let us offer our silent prayers through the voice of the Spirit. Lord, 
Lord, hear our prayers. In all things, loving parent, we pray for the strength to hope for a better time, the will to become your presence in our communities, and the guidance of the Holy Spirit in all that we do. Glory and honor be to you, all-knowing one, and to the Son whom you sent to us and taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, I'll be reading today from the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 25 through 29. Hear these words. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, in order that He might be the firstborn within a large family. May God add blessing to our reading and understanding of these words. Amen. Donna was, to most people, a frightening human being. She stood over six feet tall, and she was a very large woman. Now, while I'm not one who typically stereotypes people, Donna fit 
the image of someone who had mental illness to a perfection. She had wild hair that would go in every direction. And the look on her face was always constantly just wild-eyed. She looked like she was crazy. She was the kind of woman who, if you'd see her alone in a dark alley, you'd probably turn and go the other way. This was, on a certain level, even an appropriate response. Donna had issues with impulse control, and she had mood swings because she had a diagnosis of bipolar disorder. It would leave you constantly wondering if she was going to lunge out at you at any given moment. And yet, packaged into this young, wild-eyed, impulsive young woman, was the cognitive ability of a child. During the several years that I worked as a crisis clinician at an inner city emergency room in Indianapolis, Indiana, Donna was a frequent involuntary guest. She lived in a group home and quite regularly Donna would have episodes of verbal and physical aggression. Because of her size and her ability to cause serious damage, these episodes inevitably led to property destruction, physical injuries to herself and others, and in the end, a lot of police intervention. So usually, by the time she arrived in my emergency room, she'd be handcuffed or restrained in some other manner. She hated the group home, she hated the police, she hated the emergency room, and she didn't begin to trust anyone who would promise that they were going to help her, but who would inevitably become freaked out and intimidated by her, and they would end up restraining her, or perhaps just severely medicating her. So you can imagine her surprise when she's sitting in this emergency room, alone in a padded room, and instead of several security guards opening the door, the door becomes open, and there's this rather short guy sitting in a wheelchair with a smile on his face. That would be me. The physician attending that night thought that I was crazy myself. My response to him was, how can I expect her to trust me if I don't trust her? Now he laughed at that logic, somewhat respectfully so, but he also knew that it could be incredibly misguided. I looked her in the eyes, and again, she's expecting the worst, and I began singing this song. Now, it's a Spice Girls song, a popular British band. I have no idea if you remember the Spice Girls, but they were this British girls pop band from a few years back. The song in question has a key line that I sang to her. It goes, so, tell me what you want, what you really, really want. And you talk about catching her off guard. She laughed. I smiled. I didn't move towards her. But then I said, this time, not singing. So really, Donna, tell me, what do you really want? And so began an emergency room intervention with me sitting in the emergency room in this padded room with this wild-eyed young woman She'd periodically get really worked up, then she'd calm down. She'd get excited again, then she'd calm down again. We talked about everything. We talked about her childhood. We talked about her past. We talked about her traumas. We talked about her brain challenges, the fact that her brain wouldn't work the way she wanted it to. We talked about her size. We talked about her hair, her traumas, and her dramas. I never had any intention of restraining her, but I also knew we had a tough decision to make because it was painfully obvious that her medications were out of balance and she needed to come into the hospital. I didn't want to force her, but I knew that if she didn't come voluntarily, that that would be the only option for her safety and for the safety of others. And so I said it again. Okay, actually I did sing it again. So, Donna, tell me what you want, what you really, really want. I promise you, the Spice Girls sound better when they sing it. She looked at me and laughing said, I want you to sing a new song. 
And you know what? I said, I said, that's what I want for you too. I want you to show these people that you're not the person that they think you are. You sat here with me for hours. You've had a brilliant conversation. You've been honest and you've been open. And you know what? I've never once been scared of you. But the truth is, you know it and I know it, that you're struggling and we need to get those medications figured out. She says, I'm not going back in the hospital. Why not? What's holding you back? All they'll do is tie me down and knock me out. Can you promise me they won't? I asked her, somewhat hesitantly, have I lied to you in the hours that we've been together? She replied, no. And I said, so well, I'm not going to start now. And the truth is, Donna, I can't make you that promise. Because you know and I know that if you start freaking out, if you get excited, if you get verbally aggressive, they may have to. Or they may think that they have to. I paused. But I can promise you that I'm not going to. I won't be your staff on the unit, but I'll be there. And I'll be available. And I can guarantee you that I'm going to be writing down what happened today. And how you never had to be medicated or restrained. My fear, though, is that if we don't do this now, that you'll just keep going through this over and over and over again. And I won't be here every time. You keep saying you want to live differently. Why not start now? So, will you go with me upstairs? She asked, and I said, of course. She said, will you hold my hand? Now then, let me assure you that it's really hard to wheel a wheelchair while holding someone's hand. But if that's what it was going to take to get Donna up those stairs, and if she was going to have that much faith that I was a safe human being for her, then I was going to make it happen. So I briefly left the padded room. I informed the staff of the plan. They again thought I was pretty crazy. I agreed to have one security person nearby just in case, and I told Donna that they would be there. Then she and I came out of the room and hand in hand started going down the hallway. Now you would have thought that I was parting the Red Sea. All those familiar with Donna were in awe of this peaceful young woman walking hand in hand with me as we went to the elevator and up to the unit. She stayed in the hospital for several days. She would never be restrained. She would never be physically aggressive. And after her discharge, she would start living a higher quality life than she had ever known. Now then, when I think about faith, I think about Donna. I think about this young woman who had only ever seen rejection and humiliation and violence in her life. I mean, truly horrid violence in her life. And suddenly, truly, without almost any explanation at all, she reached out her hand and chose to believe what she could not see. There are times when we need to look at Scripture and examine its historical context. There are times when we need to look at Scripture and truly pick it apart, word by word. But there are other times when it's my job as a preacher or simply when it's our job as Christians to sit back and to allow ourselves to bathe in the glory of God's words. Sometimes we have to examine liturgical context to fully realize the power of what God's giving to us through Scripture. In the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit blows through the house like a violent wind and dances on heads like tongues of fire empowering people to speak in other tongues, in other languages, so that all might hear what God has done in Jesus Christ. In John, it stands beside us as the advocate who speaks from God in order to guide us into the truth. But here, here in Romans, we get an entirely different picture of the Holy Spirit. First off, it allows us to not bind ourselves in guilt or shame or some ridiculous belief that somehow our faith is inadequate when we suffer. This scripture points out that all of creation will experience these pains. It's not the kind of thing that will be avoided by those who do 6,000 Hail Marys 
or whose offering is big enough, or whose hours of service are long enough. We can live our lives fully committed to God, serving in every way imaginable, and experience tragedy and illness and absolutely unjustifiable evil. They can all still manage to creep into our lives. And secondly, this calls us into a clearer picture of what it truly means to live a life of faith. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? It's easy to believe when we have enough. It's easy to believe when life is good and plentiful and healthy and filled with laughter. This scripture is a reminder that faith is to be found in every moment of our lives, the joyous and the tragic, the times of smooth sailing and the times of seemingly insurmountable obstacles. The spirit groans or sighs, as in verse 26, as it gives voice to our deepest longings. This shared groaning is testimony that God is present. God is present in the midst of our greatest need, even when we do not have the words to name it. This seems to be the thrust behind the Spirit interceding for us with sighs too deep for words. A sign that the Spirit is present in our midst, even when no words are exchanged. That presence can make it possible for us to endure. The NRSV translates the end of verse 25, we wait for it with patience, but the Greek is hypomenes, endurance. We wait with endurance. Another verse from Romans illustrates the reality. Suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Knowing that God is present with us in the midst of our greatest need is the good news that enables us to endure. What does that look like where you are? Sometimes the Spirit might be with someone in his or her suffering in the form of a brother or sister in Christ by their side. Narrating that presence for the gathered community is one way that I as a preacher can make the visible the ground of our unseen hope. It looks different for each of us, wherever we are at, in our lives, in our communities, wherever we're at in the world. And yet the joy of this scripture today is that it gives us hope that the Holy Spirit is still working with us, Wherever we are, whatever we're experiencing, whatever we're enduring, God is always with us. And so it is. Amen. Jesus.
at one point in his conversation that he talks about in the sermon, Richard says, you say you want to live life differently. Why not start now? One of the things about coming to this table is that it presents an opportunity to start to live your life differently every time we come. As Richard said, the Lord's presence is a guarantee. God is always there. I would add to that that God's forgiveness is always there. And so there is always the opportunity to start over, to start again, to start anew. And when we come to the table and we think about the sacrifice that Christ made to make that so, we can be assured that God's forgiveness is wider than anything that we might have done. Let's pray. Our Lord and our God, we thank you. We thank you for Jesus who came to teach us what it means to live a life that is given to you and the service of your children. We thank you that Jesus gave his life that we might become a part of your work in this world. We thank you for these symbols, the bread and the cup, that remind us of that. And as we take this bread and as we drink this cup, fill us again with your Holy Spirit that we might begin again and still and always to live that life which is given to you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. And so we remember on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he had blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to them and said, Take and eat this. This is my body which is given for you. Eat and remember me. And after supper he took the cup, and he said, This cup is a new covenant which is poured out in my blood given for the forgiveness of your sin. As often as you drink it, remember me. And so the table is set and all is ready. The Lord is here and he awaits you. Come, join the feast. Spirit is still working with us wherever we are, whatever we're experiencing, whatever we're enduring, God is always with us. And so it is. Amen.